And now the fallout from a prize-winning investigation. A post-9-11 surveillance program by the New York City Police Department on Muslim communities has raised calls for a federal probe and sparked a debate over domestic intelligence gathering. It was first brought to light last summer in a series of reports by the Associated Press. Yesterday, the AP journalists responsible for the story were awarded a Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting. Adam Goldman is a part of the team and joins me now. And first, congratulations to you. Thank you. Tell us, uh, set the scene for us a bit. How did this start for you and your team? As far back as December 2010 and January 2011, Matt Apuzo, who was on the investigative team with me at the AP and the D.C. Bureau, we started hearing uh, terms we were unfamiliar with, moss crawlers, rakers, a demographics unit. And uh, we set about trying to unravel what those terms meant. So what did you find? Tell us a little bit about the scope of the surveillance program by the NYPD. We found that the NYPD had systematically infiltrated um, entire ethnic communities in New York City. And our investigation led us to believe that um, they weren't doing this based on leads, but merely based on the fact that these people were Muslim. And, th and that led you into, and they were looking at uh, mosques, schools. Tell us, uh, how did, how, what did that mean to infiltrate? Well, basically, uh, how you would live. They looked at where uh, Muslims shopped, or where Arabs shopped, um, where they prayed, um, where they ate, and they cataloged these daily acts of life. And what surprised you as you started to peel back layers here? Well, what surprised us um, was the extent of the infil infiltration. The other thing that surprised us was the changing, the evolution of the NYPD's narrative. Um, at first, Mayor Bloomberg had said that um, we don't do this by religion. And Ray Kelly, the police chief, said we don't do this by eth ethnicity. And in fact, um, we obtained many, many secret NYPD documents that demonstrated they were doing exactly this. Now, you and uh, your colleague, you're based here in Washington, and I gather your, your, uh, your intelligence, I guess, is, is spending more time on the CIA. Now, is there, there was, I guess, some questions about the, the CIA's uh, involvement or, or relationship to this program? Yes. Well, after 9-11, George Tennant, who was then the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, set up, sent a CIA officer to assist the NYPD. And this particular CIA officer was the architect of these spying programs. And then there were further questions about the, the program leaving the jurisdiction of New York City as well, right? Into New Jersey and Connecticut? Yeah, that came to a real head in, uh, in January um, after we exposed the fact that the NYPD had infiltrated Newark as well and applied their same counterterrorism tactics there. Meaning into the same, into the communities? Into the communities, going to the mosques, um, and treating, in fact, in, in at least one instance we found, treating mosques as if they were a criminal organization, taking pictures of people's cars, photographing who went into the mosques. So the mere act of being a Muslim was almost as if it was a crime. Now, now you mentioned the response from uh, the, from Mayor Bloomberg, from uh, Police Chief uh, Ray Kelly. They're saying this is, you know, I mean, it evolved, as you said, but the, this is their, within legal bounds. This is a tough job. They deterred terrorism, right? The NYPD says they did deter terrorism, and they have a certain narrative that they use. They they say that we've we've managed to thwart many attacks. But as we looked at um, what they say they thwarted, you know, we found, in fact, it, it wasn't the case. Um, for instance, uh, if you just take a look at the, the, uh, the, the Times Square bomber, Shazad, that was in person that the NYPD had missed, or Najib Bulazazi, who tried to blow up the subway in 2009. In fact, it was the federal government that uncovered that plot. So, you know, that led us to ask questions about, well, how effective are these programs if they've missed, in fact, the most serious plot? directed in New York City since 9-11. Well, so, so your series, I gather, raised a big debate about the whole issue of racial profiling, community profiling, ethnic profiling. What, 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 has, come of, what has come from it? Well, a, a couple things have come from it. Um, uh, the, I think our stories laid bare the fact that the Muslims in New York City don't have much of a voice. And um, they have taken to our stories as a, as a reason to, to, to mobilize. And the other thing um, is um, Eric Holder, the attorney general, said he's reviewing complaints from the Muslim community. He said he had 
I presume, read reports or read our stories, and uh, he was disturbed by what, what he found. And uh, it continues, or what, what the, the uh, I mean, the program? The, as far as we know, the, the NYPD is unap unapologetic. Um, politicians in New York City are unwilling to ask the, the questions. Is this an effective use of taxpayers' money? And does any of this work? All right. Adam Goldman of the AP, thanks so much. Thank you. Finally tonight, a look at the controversial world of forensic science. The Washington Post today reports hundreds of potentially innocent people in this country may have been convicted of crimes because of flawed forensic work. Tonight on Frontline, correspondent Lowell Bergman joins with ProPublica in investigating some specific examples. Here's a portion of that report. For over a century, fingerprints have been used to identify criminals, from petty thieves to international terrorists. In 2004, a series of explosions in the subways of Madrid killed or injured nearly 2,000 people. When the dust settled, the Spanish authorities found several partial fingerprints on a bag of detonators. Now, at the time, the Spanish National Police did not identify anybody to those prints, so they sent the prints to Interpol, who then forwarded them to the FBI. Melissa Gish is a fingerprint expert at the legendary FBI laboratory in Quantico, Virginia. The examiner analyzed the prints. He ran them through the system. And in this case, the examiner found a match. Yes, in this case, the examiner affected an identification. The FBI's identification led them to a suburb of Portland, Oregon, where a young attorney was working in his office. I got an unexpected knock on the door. I cracked the door open, and there was two individuals, a man and a woman, and they identified themselves quickly that they were FBI agents. The FBI examiner determined that this fingerprint found in Madrid matched a print taken from Brandon Mayfield when he was in the military. They proceeded to push through rather forcefully to handcuff me. It was just unbelievable. It was, it was surreal. I mean, one minute you're sitting there and you've taken your kids to school and you've said, have a good day and be a learning superstar and you're working on your case in your office and the next minute you're heading downtown in cuffs and uh, people are searching you for blasting caps and detonators. For generations, the FBI and their fingerprint examiners have maintained that fingerprint identification is infallible, routinely testifying that they are 100% certain and there's zero percent chance they could be wrong. Fingerprint examiners have been taught that there's only one person in the world who could have left this fingerprint. There's no scientific basis for that. Wait a sec. There's no scientific basis for matching like a partial fingerprint? The premise is that no two people have the same fingerprint. That's the scientific premise. Is that true? I thought so. <laughs> Has there ever been a scientific study to demonstrate that that is true? I don't think so. But even more important, how much alike do they have to be before you say that that fingerprint came from this person? What is the standard? for how many points of comparison? What's the standard, Judge? It varies from laboratory to laboratory and from witness to witness often. And some will say, we need 16 points. No, seven. And what they all end up saying is that it's really a matter of the individual experience and judgment of the fingerprint examiner. The Real CSI airs on Frontline tonight on most PBS stations.